Good afternoon. My name is Orlando Feima from TPA Global, and I would like to welcome you to our today's webinar regarding the IP subject, how to maximize the value of your IP. And as a very short introduction to IP, I would like to give and share with you a short definition of IP. IP is a category of property that includes intangible creations of human intellect. And from my experience, there are many types of intellectual property and there are countries that recognize more and countries that recognize less uh, IP rights. Uh, but the well uh, known types of IP are copyrights, patents, trademarks and trade uh, secrets. Why do we have intellectual property? Um, that law is to encourage the creation of a wide variety of intellectual goods. And to achieve this, the law gives people and businesses property rights to the information and intellectual goods that they create. And most of the time, this is only for a limited period of time. The advantage uh, is that this gives economic incentives to the creation of these rights, because people who own these rights are, are able to realize a, yeah, a profit from these uh, intellectual goods. And from a general perspective, these economic incentives are expected to stimulate innovation and basically contribute to the technological progress of countries. For today's webinar, we have invited Novo Graafs Management, Monique Graneman and Frank Enghardt. And Novo Graaf is specialized in complete services across your IP portfolio. Novo Graaf provides experience and tools to drive tangible competitive advantage and deliver process efficiencies to help their clients realize the potential of your IP. We see as TPA that Novo Graaf is one of the leading companies related to IP services. TPA, on the other hand, is one of the leading companies of valuation services and all subjects related to IP and tax. Many times in our practice, we are being asked how we basically can improve the IP structure within a group of companies from a business and tax perspective. And in many cases also valuations of IP rights are required. This is my short introduction to the IP subject of today. And having said that, I would like to give the floor to the IP specialist Monique and Frank from Novo Graaf. Yes, thank you, Orlando, for this uh, very kind introduction, uh, as well as uh, for Novo Graaf, as well as for the subject that we're talking about. I will introduce myself a little bit. Uh, my name is indeed uh, Monique Graneman. I've been working in the IP sector for uh, more than 23 years now. Um, and at Novaga for 19 years, uh, we specialize in uh, uh, IP uh, portfolio management and all uh, sub, uh, subjects that uh, come with that. Um, I'm here with my uh, colleague Frank. Maybe he can introduce, introduce himself a little bit. Hello, my name is uh, Frank Enghardt. I'm um Working in IP and also at, uh, at Novogra for around uh, 33 years. Uh, I'm currently um, uh, the Director of Legal and Compliance here at, uh, at Novogra. And uh, uh, Monique and, and I will, will give this presentation, but as they say, Monique will give the bulk of the presentation. And at the end, I will, together with Monique, uh, see if there are any questions that we can, can answer um, that are uh, related to both IP um, and your workings with or uh, in IP. Yes, and as for myself, I'm also the, the manager of our corporate account team. Uh, and also we are both part of the management team indeed of the Novograph Group. Um, well, there is a whole lot to tell you today and we have a limited time. So uh, let's start um, the presentation. Uh, I expect the audience to be mainly financial professionals. So we try to make it interesting for you, of course. Uh, the story is quite substantial, so I will start with some sheets to outline the context of IP a little bit. I will try to go through those quickly in order to come to the main subject, how to maximize the value of your IP. 
Now, we will send you the sheets afterwards, the sheets of the presentation, so you can reread all the information at your convenience uh, after the presentation as well. Now, a short introduction again of the company. Here you see on the screen some facts about us. We have been active in IP for more than 130 years. Uh, we have more than 330 IP specialists, uh, of which 82 attorneys, um, and ranked among the top IP firms in Europe. We have our offices in 17 countries, uh, 17 offices worldwide in the countries that you can see here on the screen. Um, and let me tell you that the presentation concerns all IP, also the IP that uh, Orlando has already mentioned, so uh, especially patents, trademarks, designs, copyrights, and also domain names, even though domains aren't exactly um, an IP right, intellectual property right. So the presentation is uh, considered to be very broad. However, the core business of our Amsterdam office is trademarks. So therefore, the focus of this presentation will be on trademarks. Um, Novagraaf is specialized in worldwide IP portfolio management. So that is also the angle of today's presentation. Uh, of course, the value of IP can increase also with good marketing and good brand management. But today we talk about the IP point of view uh, mainly. Now on the screen, you can see uh, that we are a full service company active in all fields of IP, but also in IP technology and tools and uh, a very important part, IP strategy. And that is also what the presentation will be about. Now, as said, the focus will be on trademarks and I will try to give you a really short introduction uh, to trademarks, especially for participants who have never worked with IP. Uh, so a very short uh, introduction and mainly uh, of what is a trademark. The identification and origin function is the main function, uh, the most important function of a trademark. It is there to, uh, a trademark is there to identify your goods or your services uh, and to, uh, uh, to differentiate them from the goods and services of other companies. Of course, also the investment and goodwill function is very important and especially also for this presentation and the subject that we're discussing, the value of your IP. Now, from a legal point of view, a trademark is an exclusive right, but also an absolute and subjective right. With a well-protected uh, and registered trademark, you can protect your company from infringers, uh, against infringers and counterfeiters. Um, a trademark can appear in many different forms. Um, for example, you can distinguish between the kinds that you see now on the screen. There are marks for goods, marks for services, also a combination is possible, a mark for goods and services. And there's a differentiation between individual marks and certification and collective marks. For example, you see the BOVA trademark on the screen. Maybe you don't know about that one because it's actually typically Dutch. Uh, but maybe you um, sometimes buy fish products in the supermarket and there on um, packaging of this fish, you can um, often see the trademark MSC or ASC with a checkmark logo, uh, which is um, used as a certification mark for uh, uh, that's that the, the, the company's ASC and MSC, they certify the chain of everything that happens uh, with fishing and uh, aquaculture um, uh, fish. So um, that's an example <laughs> of uh, uh, certification marks. Now, other types to be distinguished between trademarks are uh, word marks, such as in this example, Coca Cola. And with a word mark, you gain very broad protection on the word itself, uh, but not so much on the logo, which you will gain when you register a word and device mark, such as in the left example, the Coca-Cola with the red shield and bottle. Um, 
which is also very well known. You can also register a device mark separately, such as the swoosh of Nike, which is of course very recognizable. And also a, a packaging layout can be subject of trademark registration. Now, just to show you how many forms a trademark can be, these are some other types that uh, are variations of trademarks, 3Ds, 3D marks, um, slogans, color marks, sound marks, hologram marks, and multimedia marks, which is the newest kind of mark uh, possible to register. Now, I could fill this whole presentation with telling you about trademarks, but let's go to the main subject of today. Now, why is IP relevant for financial professionals? Let's start with some trends. Um, globalization, also IP follows economic globalization. Worldwide portfolios are uh, quite common nowadays. Um, IP teams face increasing complexity in legal and managerial tasks and IP departments are under pressure to control budgets and improve operations. Now, IP used to be mainly a subject for legal and marketing professionals. However, the subject is increasingly a finance and value story. Now, here you can see on the left side, IP is one of the largest components on the balance sheet of a company with an asset value of more than 84%. However, on the right side, you can see that from the time spent on an IP portfolio, only 9.5% of the time is spent on creating value and monetizing. Of course, that is not the case uh, with every company. A, good ex a very good example of a company that knows how to monetize their IP is, for example, Philips. Um, they earn money with their IP because they successfully license their IP, making that even their core business. And I've been told that they make more money by licensing their IP than they do of selling their products. So that's a very good uh, example of a company who knows what to do with their IP. Now, how and when are you as a financial professional possibly involved in IP. Well, there's a cash and a value side on this, uh, on this subject. Um, on the cash side, I mainly think about budgeting for the IP budget, of course, but on the value side, you can, for example, think of merger and acquisition. You can be involved in, um, in the IP. In the example of M&A, when you buy a company with IP, the IP of course has value. Now, the, the main question always should be, what are you buying? And how do you know if that IP is sustainable? Now, there are very important questions to be asked. Is the IP properly, properly registered, for example? And is the assignment, the recordal of assignment of the IP assured in the acquisition so that you make sure that the trademarks are registered in the company, in your company's name? Now, I will try to help you answer those questions uh, further on in the presentation. Now, how do you make sure you own the relevant IP? First, first, let's have a look at the IP cycle. Already in the development phase, you see a few very important points. IP protection strategy, for example, but also the trademark portfolio development, IP auditing, gap analysis, all things that you can do in order to develop your IP and your trademark strategy. Then of course, there's the preparation. And in an M&A situation, for example, a due diligence search is very important. Now, also the registration of trademark rights are very important. I will get back to that later on. Then the enforcement, how do you enforce your trademark? You can see uh, also a little bit about that, of course, on the screen. The maintenance, and I will get back on these subjects later on as well. And the monetizing, now, the monetizing, uh, you 
you can think of that in a portfolio acquisition, but also in brand valuations. Um, as Orlando mentioned, we work together on brand valuations because it's a very important part of your IP strategy. Further, you can think of licensing and due diligence, of course, in an M&A or a sales situation. Now let's dive in a little bit deeper on some of the relevant subjects. One of the main subjects in the IP cycle is registration. Without a registration, there is no trademark right. There is a legal exception on that. For example, in, uh, in common law countries, sometimes you can gain some rights by using the trademarks. But in most countries, that not, that's not the case. You need to register uh, the trademark. But also in these common law countries, in order to create real value, also in these countries, registration is key. There are four important questions that we can ask when registering a trademark. And we define them by the four W's. The who, what, where, and what for. Now the who is of course, in whose name are the rights going to be registered? Is that in your holding company as the owner of all IP rights, for example, or do you rather put the IP in the company that is using that specific trademark? Now questions to be asked when registering. The what is, for example, uh, the different types of marks that we've seen before. Do you register a word mark or a device mark or a word device mark or maybe all three of them? The where is important as in where are you registering in which countries or which territories? Where do you use the mark? Where do you produce the mark, for example? And what for? The, uh, the fourth W is which goods and services are you going to use the trademark for now or in the future? Also an important question in how do you make sure you own the relevant IP is in an M&A situation. As already mentioned uh, in M&A, it is essential to have an external um, trademark perf uh, attorney perform a due diligence search to determine what exactly it is you buy. Are there gaps in the portfolio? Are there trademarks under legal procedure? You should know about that before buying uh, the IP uh, in the company. But also make sure you actually record the assignment of IP rights to your company in the relevant registers. Another question to be asked is how do I maintain my rights on IP? Trademarks are to be renewed every 10 years. So you can know in advance uh, when you have to renew the trademark. If the trademark is still in use, you of course want the renewal. Um, but another uh, part of the maintenance of your IP right is enforcement. Um, in order to prevent dilution of your trademark rights. If you don't um, stop infringers of making use of trademarks, that are identical or similar to yours, then your trademark might dilute, which would uh, decrease the value, of course, of that trademark. Now, once you know what IP you own, and of course, in order to make sure that you have a good grip on your IP portfolio, you should always develop an IP strategy. That can be done, of course, with your internal, but also your external trademark attorneys. And the external trademark attorney will always determine that in cooperation with all relevant persons at your company, such as the marketing department, the brand manager, but also, of course, the financial professionals who might have something to say about the budget. Now, when you want to start um, drafting your IP strategy, there are eight key questions to be asked. For starters, about the management. Who is responsible for the IP in your company? That is an important question. Who is involved? Um, of course, also when you want to create new uh, IP, um, 
it's also of course important who is involved but also do you know what rights you own create and use now for the protection what measures have you taken to protect your ip not only the registration is important but also for example uh, the enforcement and how can you do that for example with a watching subscription where you are informed every time somebody some company registers a trademark that is identical to or similar to your trademark so that you can timely take action against that that's also a part of the enforcement do you know what your competitor is doing with your ip and do you have the licenses you are entitled to but last but not least, of course, how can you improve the exploitation of your IP rights? And that is also something that I will get back to you on a little bit later on in the presentation. These are all questions uh, for your IP strategy. Also in the IP circle that we've seen in another form earlier in the presentation, there are many questions to be answered. Now, if we lift out the exploitation part, does the company know the costs, benefits, but also the return on investment of its IP? And is it clear what actions need to be taken to increase that return on investment? Uh, and of course, is the board regularly updated on the IP strategy costs and benefits? As concerns the value of IP, IP of course costs money. The registration, the enforcement, the protection, everything costs money, but it can also generate money. Now these are examples how you can literally generate money from your IP. You can of course license your patents or your trademark, trademarks. But another option that we see regularly at this uh, uh, point in time um, also is pledging. Um, I advise a large bank on their trademark portfolio and I see a lot of registrations of pledge uh, coming by, especially now also during the pandemic uh, time. It's an easy way to, to loan money from the bank uh, based on your IP and what it's worth. And a third option is of course always the possibility to sell your IP. Now don't forget to take these points up in your overall IP strategy. Part of the strategy in an IP portfolio is also, of course, budgeting. Oh, there we are. At Novcraft, we timely for provide inputs on the budgets of our clients. And we therefore use our innovative tools, such as our online um, client portal, Easy IP. Um, there are different subjects to be taken up, of course, in the budget for trademarks. You can consider new filings if you are developing a new trademark in your company for new products, for example. Uh, then you should reserve some budget for new filings. The renewals are, of course, a part of the budget where you are um, timely aware of what's coming up because it's, uh, as I said, Trademarks are renewed every 10 years, so you know in advance uh, what is going to happen next year and which trademarks are to be renewed. You, of course, also should reserve some budget for the enforcement. What if some party infringes on your trademark rights? You need to enforce your rights to them. That could be uh, just in an, uh, that could be in an opposition procedure, an administrative procedure but also litigation is uh, possible and you should always have some room in your budget to do that. Now, of course, there's also uh, risks in, um, in budgeting because you, you, you never know in advance everything. So you need to discuss that with your external trademark attorney in order to be uh, sure that you know all about the risks. Now, renewals are usually a large portion of the budget, especially when it's a larger portfolio. Trademarks need to be renewed, so that is very foreseeable. But it is also a chance. Oh, I don't know what's happening, but it's also a chance for savings. 
So in the next uh, couple of sheets, I will provide you some tips for savings on IP in your budget. Um, an organized portfolio is always good to have because then you are um, certain about which costs you will uh, you have to make. Centralization is, for example, uh, a very good thing, thing to do for organizing your portfolio. So that the IP of the whole company and all its entities is in one hand. So you have the big overview on what you have. That could be also the centralization of ownership. Um, as I said before, you can, of course, register all your IP on, for example, the holding company. Um, but that's not necessary in order to organize the portfolio. It can also be uh, a decentralized ownership as long as the, um, the, the managing of the portfolio is in one hand. Now, you can also use a budget reduction, if that is necessary, as a chance to call that wood in your brands and your territories. Trademarks um, have to be in use. If you don't use the trademark for several years in some countries, you don't have to renew that. You have to look at that and, and make uh, choices about that. But also if you've registered your trademark for many goods or services, and you find that in this or that country, you don't use the trademark for all those goods and services, you might uh, limit the renewal to less classes, which would deduct the costs. Um, well, of course, your um, external trademark attorney can help you with the tips on how to save costs on your renewals. And actually, a good trademark attorney will advise you on that proactively. Now, also, costs can easily be saved on enforcement without losing your IP rights or without decreasing the value. Um, you can, of course, uh, limit your actions in the brands for the brands and the territories you are very active in, only your core brands or your core territories. Um, but a really good option to save costs on your enforcement is try to find an amicable settlement. Of course, that is not always possible. It's if it's a flagrant infringement, you might have to go to court right away. But in some uh, in some um, uh, options, there are uh, options to uh, to settle the matter. For example, with a demarcation agreement, uh, demarcation on territory. For example, if you are in the EU and the other um, party is only active in the US, you can demarcate on the territory, but you can also demarcate on the goods and services so that you make sure that in practice the, there will be no overlap and more importantly, no confusion between the brands. Another option is to use automated technology to manage your online brand protection. Novograph has really recently developed a very new tool, online brand protection. Uh, and I will give you some information at the end of the presentation on this. Uh, but in this tool, we use automated enforcement. Now, you can imagine that using automated enforcement, so automated sending out of letters or notice and takedowns, uh, things like that, will save you a lot of costs from expensive uh, lawyers or maybe even trademark attorneys. So that's also a good way to uh, limit the costs on enforcement. Now, there are of course uh, risks as said. Uh, you cannot just abandon a trademark. It's possible that there is a license registered or maybe a pledge or anything else uh, or maybe the, the trademark is used as a basis for an opposition or a litigation procedure. So if you uh, abandon the trademark, uh, as if to say not to renew the trademark, that can of course be a big risk. So you cannot just let go of trademarks. You should always involve the brand manager in the decision making together with your external trademark attorney. And last but not least, always think of the long term. You might save costs by not renewing your trademarks now or not enforcing your trademarks now. But in the long run, it will always cost more money if the trademarks are still 
uh, used by the company. So always ask for advice before deciding to assess uh, all the risks. So it's already time to come to a conclusion. As said, obtaining IP costs money, but it can also generate money. We've given some example of that in the presentation and mainly, of course, licensing, pledging and sale, sale of, the, of the trademarks. In the management, there are choices to be made. Choices to be made when setting up your IP strategy. And how can IP be managed more efficient in order to create more value? The key is IP strategy. You should have a good IP strategy in order to be able to maximize the value of your IP. Now, these are examples of how we can help. Of course, uh, Novagraaf is always, uh, we, would, we would love to help you with um, drafting your IP strategy. We use various reports and insights that can help you in making the right strategic decisions. There is, of course, the strategy update on the basis of a strat strategic plan. Keep you informed at all times. The detailed analysis of the performance of your current IP portfolio. And it's all aimed at efficiency, protection, creating value and budget management. But of course, also financial reporting in the form of, for example, the IP valuation, the licensing and the pledging, the IP in an M&A or sale, and of course, the due diligence uh, part of that. And of course, cost development, budget breakdown and renewal forecasts to help you budget for your IP. Now we have some customized reports for that, that you can see on the right. And for example, also financial reports. Now, if you have any questions or want to know on how we do things at Novagraaf, you can, of course, always contact me or my colleagues. Now, as promised, I will show you just a little bit about our tools. This is our client portal, online management portal, uh, Easy IP. You can read all about it later on when we send you the sheets and also some very short information on the online brand protection tool, which is, as said, very cost effective. These are my contact details. So now it's time for the questions that you might have. You can use the chat function for that. And let me see if I can already see about that. So if you have any questions, you can, of course, ask them now. Ronnie, well, this is Orlando. I just have one question, okay. um, and I just read it for you. From a global trademark perspective, are there regions that you, as Novo Graaf, would actually advise not to protect, either based on difficulty to enforce rights in that particular region, or maybe also from a prohibitive cost perspective for registration in? in such a region. I will give the floor uh, to Frank for this. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a very good uh, question, actually. Um, the, the thing is that with the trademark protection or IP protection um, should uh, ideally um, precede your, uh, your commercial actions uh, or at least coincide it or um, if, uh, if that doesn't work out, follow it. And that means that if you are going to uh, start uh, commercial activities in say South America or in Australia or New Zealand, 
then ideally you have already your IP portfolio in that, uh, that area in place. Now, um, your, your question is, should I perhaps not try to obtain IP protection uh, in certain areas of the world because it's either too difficult or too expensive? With respect to, to trademarks, the question is uh, no. I, I don't think there are any regions in, in the world where I would say uh, trademark protection is so expensive that you shouldn't start expanding your business to that area. There are, of course, differences depending on your filing strategy. Uh, for instance, uh, filing through a so-called international registration in countries like China, Australia, um, but also the United States and, and Canada, uh, and now uh, newly joined countries like Brazil, is, relatively speaking, very cost effective, not expensive at all. But if you, for instance, file a trademark application in the United Arab Emirates, you see that the cost may be like tenfold to what you're used in other countries. Depending, of course, on your on your on your business, I would say that for most mid-size and larger companies that are exporting, trademark uh, application costs are not really an issue. If you migrate to uh, designs or patents, then you do see that in countries like United States or Japan, cost of obtaining patent protection or design protection, what they call their design patent protection, is a bit perhaps more prohibitive. Uh, that means that you that is very important to have yourself uh, well informed about those costs uh, before you uh, contemplate um, a protection there, and not only the initial cost but also the cost that could evolve if in during the application procedure something goes wrong. Now, with respect to enforcement, I have to say that the situation is a little bit uh, different in the sense that you have to be very careful for in some countries to start litigation. Um, if you start litigation uh, in anywhere in Europe, you usually can assess what the cost risks are. Um, and uh, for a trademark dispute, um, you could end up to an amount of, let's say, 10 to 20,000 euros, and that would be in the region of the maximum. Um, but if you go to the United States and you really get into a trademark infringement case, then the cost can uh, also be tenfold. Um, uh, so, so think about 100 to 150,000 US dollars, um, if really things go, uh, go uh, wrong either way. And that means that it is very important to, once you have your IP in place uh, and you see uh, any counterfeit, have yourself uh, advised and uh, be cautious when to uh, to attack or be cautious when you are in a position that you have to defend yourself uh, on the on the cost aspects and uh, please do not try to to uh, do something yourself with sending emails or threatening letters uh, have yourself um, assisted by counsel um, and any good uh, European counsel will uh, uh, ask the assistance of a U.S. council or a Japanese council, a local council is, in that case, very important. Um, does that answer your question, Orlando? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. We have a question from Sonia. What are the economic criteria taken into account to establish the price of a trademark license? That's a, that's, a, that's a good one. Uh, the thing is that um, uh, assessing the value of, uh, of uh, trademarks or other IP laws, or sorry, IP rights, is actually not something that we're doing uh, ourselves uh, at, uh, at Novograph. Um, I'm not sure whether that could be a, a question for, uh, uh, for Orlando to, to, to answer, but I just wanted to say one thing. It's extremely important that if you are selling your IP right to a third party, that you also make sure that uh, what you're selling is something that has been registered properly um, and uh, that it doesn't backfire in the sense that you're selling a trademark registration that has not been filed for the, for the proper goods or services for which it has been used or that there is anything else faulty with uh, the, the IP right you're selling. 
course, vice versa, the same with the IP rights that you're buying. Now, the thing is that um, I, I, you could, of course, you have models to to uh, come to a, a certain uh, a value of a, of a trademark that is in use, um, depending on, on the part of the business uh, that it is attached to and what, is, what the market uh, share is. Uh, so, so there are a lot of variables, but I have to admit at the end of the day, it's perhaps a little bit the same as with a stamp collection or a foreign coin collection. Uh, the price is, is, is determined uh, how much the, the buyer wants it. I don't see any questions on the screen now, Rosanna. So if you see them, uh, please read them out. Yes, uh, there was only this question in from Sonia. If anyone else would like to ask Monique or Frank any questions, please provide them now. I received a different question uh, for Monique, uh, basically. Um, could you, uh, Monique, give some insight how Novogaaf actually can help its clients in the monitoring of infringements and how you can actually help when infringements take place, how this enforcement can be more automated? Okay, um, well, the monitoring, we have uh, different kinds of, uh, of things that we do to monitor. Um, the main and, and, and main product for that that we use is a trademark watching, um, which we have been using for many, many years. Uh, with trademark watching, you get informed every time a third party uh, registers a trademark that is identical or similar to your trademark and is registered in the same classes that your trademark is registered in. So that uh, you can timely file an opposition where necessary against this uh, uh, registration, but also if necessary, write a cease and desist letter uh, to that party in order to stop them from using the trademark. Um, so that's a very important tool, trademark watching. If you have trademarks registered, I think that you should always have them in a watching subscription uh, in order to be able to protect them properly. Now, the enforcement is, of course, the actual filing of oppositions or the, the sending of cease and desist letters, of course, procedures that we can do uh, for you worldwide. Um, as Frank just mentioned, if it is in a country uh, not uh, being the EU or the Benelux or, or whatever. We have a worldwide network of uh, representatives in every country of the world where we can make use of their expertise in order to file the opposition to send the cease and desist letter and if necessary, but hopefully not, start litigating. Um, now another uh, type of monitoring that we have done already for many years is domain name monitoring. Um, if, of course, your trademark is used in a newly registered domain name, uh, you will want to know who has done that and what you can do about it. Because uh, it might well be that somebody will infringe your trademark rights on the website used under that domain or is preventing you from using a very important domain name yourself. So that is what our domain name monitoring is for. Now, I said we have a really new and innovative product, online brand protection, which is, of course, because online infringement is, is, uh, is getting more relevant uh, every year. Uh, a lot of infringement is taking place online, on websites, in domain names, on um, social media, on marketplaces so as Alibaba, like Alibaba or uh, the likes. Um, so we have this tool now that is that can uh, monitor your brands uh, on the internet in every kind of way, which where is also made use of automated enforcement. We have seen cases where 200 infringements could have been could be taken down in one action, which will save you, of course, a lot of costs. It's a really great tool, and I would love to tell you more about it. So if anybody has any questions about that, they can contact me and we can start uh, a screening uh, to show you how uh, your brands can be protected on the internet. 
So does that answer your question, Orlando? Yes, Monique, thank you very much. Great. Just to add something to it, I think it's very important to have a structured approach uh, because uh, traditionally what, what, what usually happens is that someone in, uh, in, in let's say, your sales or, or export department uh, uh, finds something or uh, customer administration uh, report uh, when they, when, when in, in an import case, that there's a potential uh, infringement uh, case. And, then we follow that up, but that feels like you're just trying to fix one hole um, in in the wall, uh, and uh, there may be many other holes that you're not aware of, uh, and your 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 budget is actually then perhaps going to a smaller counterfeiter, while uh, uh, unseen someone bigger is uh, trying to to enter your market with a counterfeit product, and that means that those watching tools and 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 also the the online watching tools are very important. Now, a lot of clients are saying, okay, but then I get too much information going to be swamped. Uh, are you also going to provide me with two internal uh, uh, legal people to, to deal with it? And that's just what Monique said. The thing is that with, uh, with the technical possibilities that we have nowadays, it's not a case by case action uh, that we have to do as it were manually. Uh, you can put a uh, 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 software in place that that, that automatically uh, reacts once you have assessed uh, that it is an infringement and that really goes very quick, quickly and, and, and cleans up the, let's say, the, the internet mess for you. Yeah, thank you, Frank, for this, uh, for this addition. Um, I'm looking to Rosanna because I did not receive more questions. Rosanna, did you receive uh, further no. questions? There's no more questions on um, my side either. Um, okay. M Monique, did you receive additional questions? No, I don't see any. Then I think we are basically in time. Um, and I want to thank you, Monique and Frank, for this very insightful presentation about IP. This was really very okay. helpful in getting a better understanding of IP and especially uh, trademarks. Um, also the monitoring and, you know, controlling and um, automation that, that Novograf puts in place um, that you explained based on, on, on my question is, is very impressive. And um, for all the clients who are listening, if you have questions about um, IP or trademarks, please, um, yeah, get in contact with, uh, with Novograf and they can help you with all the questions. If it is about valuations, you can always, or taxes and IP uh, rights, you can always also contact uh, TPA. I want to thank you, Monique and Frank, one more time, and thank the audience for, yeah, for your patience and for listening. And um, yeah, in any case, if there is a question also afterwards, please contact us at your convenience. And then I want to end this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Orlando.